Ah, finally, using two computers the way. So I'm just going to briefly take you through the call for project funding uh, this fall. And then after that, we'll have uh, some presentations of, uh, of example with examples, internal projects. So, I mean, the, the whole idea behind uh, our internal funding is that we would like to uh, motivate uh, our colleagues to contribute to the higher uh, visions and uh, goals. So it's basically be summarized in these three, you know, four points. Uh, this is the same as Eva showed you, uh, Eva showed you last year. Uh, develop teaching and learning cooperation across the participant universities, that's one thing. Engage students, improving the learning environment. Develop teaching and learning in geoscience and promote subtle activity. And all this is kind of the, the main, uh, uh, aligned with the main goals of um, IERT. Uh, so one thing, you know, contribute to one or more of the five IERT progress domains. Check it out. It's the, you know, it's the uh, uh, one percent on the web page. Um, align the vision as we have in the screen in front of you. Uh, and then one very important thing, if you can do some co-creation with students, that's also very appreciated. Uh, engage your students, uh, use students as partners, uh, that's very valuable. And if you can have a project that involves more, more than yourself, uh, also of course if you can uh, get other institutions uh, on board, that's also uh, very valuable for these projects. Um, and then uh, have a plan for uh, peer review or uh, or a presentation or a subtle conference or generate something around that. And then you have to include a plan for communication and sharing. Uh, this is some bullet point that you should uh, look through when you uh, write your, uh, your proposal. Yeah. Uh, so how to apply? It's quite easy actually. Uh, there is a IR project funding application form at our webpage. We put out the call the 15th of September. The deadline is the 15th of October. Uh, there will be a similar call in the spring semester. Um, we have uh, around between five and seven hundred thousand a year for this in our budget, uh, and we have said that you know we shouldn't. The budget should be within 5,000 or 50,000. But if there is need for bigger projects, it's possible to apply for the same project several times um, if it's uh, something that is important. Uh, the uh, evaluation of these uh, projects uh, is uh, done by uh, the education chairs at the institutions. You see the picture of them here, uh, plus uh, me and Thea, and also a student representative. We also uh, sometimes, sometimes uh, have had the even normal videos. We can also have other uh, experts with a pedagogical background so that can take part in the evaluation. Yes. So, um, what can what can you apply for? Uh, a little bit the same thing as I mentioned in the beginning here, but this is a little bit more specific. Uh, student active learning is a backbone of uh, what we would like to implement in IERT. So if you have any ideas of uh, transforming your uh, uh, courses into more using more student active learning approaches, that's a very nice uh, uh, thing to, uh, to uh, buy for. And then also student activities, um, development of new uh, teaching uh, Material or methods that's related a little bit to, to the student active learning uh, approach. And then, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's also needed to maybe change something and uh, to learn after the COVID lockdown. So, related to that, could be something. Uh, activities that uh, uh, helps improve the student learning environment is also very, very much welcome. Testing of not new techniques, new digital tools, or whatever new methods in teaching, um, according to literature, is of course good. For example, if you would like to try out team-based learning for a course, um, and then all kind of subtle activities is uh, very, very much welcome. Uh, that's um, very important for us in IR to uh, get more of. Yeah, and then there is. Also, of course, if you would like to develop stuff, uh, this sort of relation to 
videos or uh, software or instructional videos. This is just some examples that can be extended. Yeah, so two years, five to 50,000. We're not covering uh, teaching sabbaticals, field work or excursions on existing courses, and we are fortunately not uh, allowed to uh, use this money on equipment. Uh, that uh, uh, lies within the DECO funding and not giving us the, the funding for buying stuff. You know? So this is all uh, this is a little bit tricky because sometimes equipment is uh, critical for, uh, for us. But equipment needs to be uh, covered by the institutions. So that's, uh, that's how it is. So, and then um, you're gonna do a report, very short. Um, you know, uh, this is on this point. Um, align the uh, project aim compared to the result is important. And also a small budget, how you use the money. Uh, and then, of course, it would be nice if you say something about the follow-up uh, plan. And the dissemination uh, is also uh, can be very easy, but we will encourage you to uh, try to connect it to the Geo Learning Forum somehow. Either you could suggest a workshop there, or you can have a post, post presentation there, whatever. We can also have a workshop in the department. Uh, and of course, uh, it would also be nice if you have planned for a scientific application, but that's a little bit longer run. But that's also a way to, to disseminate this. Yes. Uh, so I think that was uh, very quickly. I used so much time on uh, setting this up. So I think we just stop there. Um, and then we can take uh, a little round of questions if anyone has anything. Uh, you can read all this in the web page. Uh, the web page it will very soon be brand new. We are working on it to update it. So that's an exciting work that we are uh, working on this call. But are there any questions to this uh, call? Yeah, Kathy. Hi, thanks. Really great to see the funding that's available uh, and encouraged that uh, there's so many people here that are obviously interested. Uh, one question I have is a really practical one. If I was to come up with a great idea or any of the other sort of Professor Twos involved in IEARTH were to come up with an idea, does the funding need to stay within the four collaborative institutions or could some of that funding go to uh, an external institution to lead that work. Yeah, that could that that could easily go to external uh, institution, and that's also something that we encourage. You know, we have also institutions uh, in geoscience in Norway that are outside the uh, formal I structure, and mm -hmm. uh, I mean collaboration with those would also be great. So yeah, that's not a problem at all. So you're well, very welcome to suggest that. Okay. I Thanks. should also that's say good. that uh, you know we are in a we have looking through you know the how much money we actually have paid out to the pro projects that we already have, have granted. And I see that uh, not all projects are uh, have started running, you know. So we are actually also thinking about, you know, to revise this. Maybe it's better, now we have the 50,000 corona limit, maybe you should extend that a little bit. But that's something we are thinking about. We'll see how this goes. But this is the third call we have, uh, and we might change the program a little bit. Uh, as we learn how it's working best. Other questions? Yeah, I had a question. Yes. Uh, so you listed a few things that, that it's not covering, but then what can we use it for? Uh, for example, can we use it to, to pay somebody to do some work for us? Can Absolutely. We, yeah. so, so do you have a couple of examples of on what yeah, you can you can use it for hiring, for example, a master student or a extend a contract for someone. You know, if they want to do some work for you, um, you can uh, even uh, use uh, if you need some external external resources, you could spend the money on that. You know, uh, it could be uh, having a workshop. Uh, you know, paying travel for people, uh, things like that. So the equipment thing is the tricky thing. If you need to buy something physically, that's the tricky part. Otherwise, you know, uh, all kind of activities uh, around your teaching activity. Can we pay ourselves if we want need to do some work for that? 
Uh, yeah, if your salary is not covered, then you can do it, but you cannot, like, it's, it's not enough money to, for example, give you know, a joint position, so that's tricky, but uh, what kind of position do you have? That's the question, you know, if you, if you have a 50% position, of course, then you can, uh, you can uh, pay yourself. Okay. Right. Yeah. okay, thank you. So, but if you have any further questions, please contact me or Thea. Uh, we will help you out. I hope that many of you will uh, will apply. Uh, and I, as I said, we have quite a lot of money this for this call. It okay. could maybe also be more than seven hundred thousand. Uh, so it's well worth trying to apply now. Okay, Thea. Then I just uh, give the word back to you, and you can introduce the other speakers. <clears throat> Yeah, um, our next speaker is Tor Einar, so then you can just share your screen, and then the floor is yours. Screen. Sorry. Screen is yours, yeah. Can you all see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Great. So uh, the title of my project is uh, formally writing a subtle paper on students' perception of computational problem solving in a geoscience course. Uh, the working title, however, is a little more tangible. It is time to write a subtle paper. So it, it, it kind of touches upon the question that Sven just asked, because the gist of my application was to buy myself time to write, basically. Uh, so, writing takes time, and especially for someone like us, like geoscience or microbial, like people who aren't in the profession of, of pedagogy or teaching uh, mainly. So, it, it takes time, and you need, a, there's a lot of things to put yourself into, and obviously, as well, the PhD period doesn't really provide adequate time to do it, you're expected to fill your one year of, uh, of uh, mandatory work, well, not with writing. I was lucky enough to be an exception to this, but still that the time provided within my one year of mandatory work what is not sufficient. So I've applied, I applied and received extension or funding, which is going into paying me for some days to to work more on uh, the paper I'm writing. Uh, well, it, it, it should be said about my background that I am a teacher by profession before I started off as a PhD. So this is something that I am highly involved with and I, that I like to do. And also in terms of career development, obviously showing that you can do research on your own uh, teaching is a nice asset if I'm going down the the academia road. Um, I was also asked why my project is related or how my project is related to iEarth. Um, my project focuses on, well, transferable skills and professional competencies, uh, which is part of the shaping the future progress domain. I also, this is something I'm really happy about is that I was able to involve a master's student all the way from the project beginning back in 2018, actually. Uh, and Seriana was involved with making or setting up the project, teaching the course that the project is based around and is now helping writing the paper. Hopefully she's gonna be able to attend the ISOTL uh, conference virtually that is occurring in about a month. Uh, in any case, the, the work is gonna be presented there. And well, finally, it also hits the project domain three in that it takes a subtle approach to teaching. Well, the project itself is mainly based around doing some interviews about with students after the first implementation of GOV 114 in the fall of 2019. Uh, it's a course and an implementation I'm sure most of you are becoming familiar with, uh, but the the after work is still going on and one of the main goals of the after work is trying to see how we can 
do how we can use programming and student active learning and uh, all, how we can use that to improve the teaching and and have a well subtle scholarly uh, based approach to that so it also affects this culture for learning uh, finally i've i've already mentioned this i was asked how the project is doing today uh, as i said the project started back in 2018 has been a, the main component of my uh, teaching as a phd student already uh, but the time was insufficient so i needed more funding and uh, the manuscript thus far has received feedback from critical friends uh, in the summer and is now nearing completion. I hope to submit it uh, this year. And I'm also presenting the digital poster on ISOTL 21. Sadly, I'm not able to participate on the geolearning forum, but maybe I'll be there by proxy, for instance, Bjarte, who is also involved with the project. That was, well, five minutes sharp. That was my uh, my presentation. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you, Turaina. It looks like there are no questions here. Um, if you come up with some, we can have some, or we can sum it up at the very end. Um, the next one should be Daniel Kramer. So the screen is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you all see my uh, presentation? Yes. Good. Uh, so my name is Daniel and I'm um, a student in Canada, which relates a bit to the question that was earlier. So I'm actually not Norwegian or at the, uni um, at the Norwegian University. But I'm working with uh, Marius here at UNIS, and we have the project FROST funded for um, fieldwork instructions for students and teachers. And um, um, our project uh, contains, we want to make virtual field trips from selected sites here in Svalbard, where we do uh, our fieldwork. So students can go there before or after, revisit the site and like look around what's there. Uh, that's especially important um, if you think about like uh, when people come here at polar night and everything is dark, so they have a bit of an overview. And the other part is instructional videos for handling um, meteorological and oceanographic, uh, oceanographic uh, instruments. And um, why did we do that? Um, mainly to have uh, individual preparation time for students, but also for instructors when they come up here, uh, they're new to the team or you haven't taught this course in a few years, that you can uh, revisit the material. Then um, if there's the next COVID, I put that in quotation mark. It mustn't be like a, a pandemic, but like, you know, a teacher could get sick or so. And then you have like just more advanced uh, learning materials. And um, also we want to go up more on a multimedia approach. So the classical thing is uh, lectures and, and text documents. And I think there's a, a lot of you guys have probably been on YouTube and other platforms to uh, watch instructional videos with uh, animations and everything. And this is uh, a route that we wanted to go down. And uh, yeah, who are we? It's uh, it's me and uh, a master student in Canada um, from the um, Polar Research Group in in Sherbrooke, and uh, from the University Center in Svalbard. It's uh, Marius and Ranghai, who are professors here for atmospheric science and uh, oceanography. And uh, right now, our project is actually ongoing. I'm right now on the IOS funding to extend my stay here in Svalbard to uh, continue um, the work that we were planning on the videos. And we had already a couple of uh, volunteers here that helped us out, including our students that are right now participating in the course. And also uh, Thomas Spengler, who is a professor in Bergen. And um, he will also contribute a little bit to this um, on a voluntary basis. And this is our main or our first bridge to the mainland, so to speak. And uh, we applied, um, why did we apply? So usually when the course starts in late August, we have like a week, a week or two to bring the students up to speed with the safety and with the um, well, with the science and feedback preparations. So it's always a bit uh, very dense time. And if we have more material online, um, they can do like self-paced learning. Uh, learning. Uh, then, as I said before, we wanted to improve the quality of our materials. And uh, we had that planned already for quite some time, but never really get around to when you come here, you start with the course preparation. It's a lot of work and then you never have the time to actually sit down, do the video documentation and, and things like that. 
So the status of our project, as I said, it's like right now ongoing. We had some field work a couple of weeks ago where we documented a lot of stuff with uh, with video and, and pictures, had some students involved. And right now my time at UNIS, uh, I'm modeling some of the instruments, doing some of the animations, and we are working on overlapping um, real footage and these animations in like in one video or in, in several. And we are also planning to do some VR applications uh, in the near future. And by the end of the year, we hope to have the instructional videos ready, or at least some of them, and also our first virtual tours. And now I have like uh, three examples of uh, what we are planning. So uh, here, if I start this video, you see me explaining a little bit um, what we do um, for one of those metrological stations. So that's basically me in front of a green screen. The picture in the background was taken during field work from, uh, from an air pass. And then we add like this uh, modeled weather station in there and we can explain a little bit around and uh, show where the stuff should be going, what is important to, to pay attention to. And also we plan to record uh, the screen. So if you have like a um, complicated software or like a new software for the students that they kind of know where, have to, where they have to click. And once we're on the field, um, we can concentrate like on, on other things. Um, the second one is a virtual field trip. So in the first stage, we were uh, asking ourselves, like, can we do it? Or rather, how can we do it? And then in the second stage, uh, we acquired like a lot of data. And now we are somewhat in the third stage where we do the fine tuning, do the usability, and then also want to publish. And here's also a small video. So this picture was uh, is in the same area at Kapline. And then the first stage was uh, we took Arctic Dam data and Google satellite images, overlapped them in a GIS and then exported this to Blender. And all of the data and all of the software we are using is uh, free software. So everyone could do that uh, in, the same, uh, in the same way. And now uh, we skip stage two here in the video and go right to stage three. So um, here you can see this is a 360 picture from one of the drones. And um, you see these little dots on the side uh, here. So you click on these and then you can either go to different sites um, or uh, add additional information. For instance, the instructional videos and uh, now we switch uh, in a second to another site and you have here again like the area where we worked and here in the bottom you can see us while we were setting up one of those weather stations and the third stage is now here this is not yet uh, really uh, in the final stage basically none of the videos are yet we are still working on the on the fine tuning and here you can see like um, this doesn't really look good yet this is a satellite dish that has some holes in it so we are working on this on, on fixing that and um these video also this 3d model can be linked to this um, videos from before so um, it's all like uh, one big product and you jump from one side to another and uh, the we will apply again we had a, a good collaboration here so far and plan to to do more and we want to continue the frost project adding lectures to this this is uh, with the uh, thomas Spengler from bergen uh, do more videos and more innovations and also um, continue the virtual field trips for more sites and then we have an, uh, another upcoming project that we plan to apply for this is here. What you can see is uh, we put like the science data basically in a gaming engine and um, make a video game out of it. And here you see like this uh, tether sound uh, or tether balloon um, we created, uh, I created in Blender and it's using, it has been used for Frost, uh, but you can also easily export it in this video game and then you can make the different stations. So if people come up here, as I said before, in the dark, they can run around the map and uh, see and visit the different station uh, stations and uh, in the beginning it will be just exploratory games so you just walk around and see stuff but later on we maybe um, can implement like content like a polar bear running around and if you get too close you lose some life or something like that and um, yeah the last thing we want to do is a video about the video so right now there's a few people here at UNIS that have the skills to put all of that together but uh, it's kind of like at UNIS with a few people and we plan to make a video um, how you actually create this multimedia content. And um, yeah, this is also a point where we would like to reach out to other IRS people or students um, that want to uh, get in touch with us. Uh, we are very happy for more collaboration and um, yeah, maybe more bridges to the mainland. And I think that's uh, the end of my presentation. If you have any questions. Sounds very interesting, and uh, can you? I was wondering what what kind of platform are you using for your uh, for the virtual field trip? How is what interface is that? Uh, um, the one is Roundme, and the other one is Sketchfab. 
And uh, I think I saw uh, Raphael here. He is uh, in an, uh, an expert on that. Uh, that is mainly uh, his idea. So um, maybe he can say a few words. But uh, I think the site is called Round Me for this 360 pictures and Sketchfab for this 3D model. And they are also freeware. Um, no license. Uh, I think to a certain degree you have like a limited upload is uh, uh, if you don't pay for it. Um, but yeah, I think like the, the basic stuff is free. Yeah, basically that's that, Daniel. <laughs> Looks very cool. Looking forward to the to see this. <laughs> Amazing. Any further questions? Well, thank you so much for your presentation, Daniel. That uh, looks really interesting. Um, okay, then I think we should skip to Florina. The screen is yours. Um, okay, one second. So I hope you see me now and also my screen. Um, yeah, I'm also I'm a master student at UNIS, so I'm also up here on the island at the moment. Um, and I also have Marius is also my supervisor, so I think Marius uh, managed to get a lot of IRF projects uh, running this year. Uh, and my IRF project is about a teaching manual for field assistants and tier science, and it's based on a course Marius taught this March. Um, so a field assistant um, could uh, participate and learn. Uh, a bit about like the methods in the field and how to teach in a in the field because uh, some of us are like just thrown in there and it's the first time teaching and even if we have some teaching experience in the classroom it is just different than like being out in the field with students than being in a classroom with them and after that course um, it was basically the idea to uh, document all of the results and the discussions during that course um, and so Mari said the idea to have a IOF project about it and approached me if I would like to do that. And um, so we basically applied for money to pay me some hours to put the work into that. Um, and yeah, as I already said, the, yeah, the project is um, about this uh, manual for field assistance. And up here we have basically in every course, uh, we have some field work included. And um, if we read through the feedbacks after the course, every student basically mentioned like, yeah, fieldwork is great. And like fieldwork is the one thing they remember or like it will like, yeah, if you also, if you yourself uh, experience some fieldwork, you know that it sticks with you and like you get inspired to do more or something like that. And so we know that fieldwork is a great part, but like how do we actually get the most out of it? Um, and uh, the most thing, like the one big thing is uh, like probably to be prepared even as like a student, the course responsible and the assistant. And as a course responsible, you probably run the course several times already. So you kind of know what to expect. As a student, it might be your first time being out, having some practical experience, um, especially up here, being the first time out there in the Arctic in a harsh environment. So your head is all over the place anyway. And as a field assistant, you should kind of try to close that gap in between. So you have a lot of responsibility, but you sometimes don't get any advice how to do that. And that's where we basically want to step in with this project to write this manual to have for a field assistant kind of like a guideline, something they can look into and kind of know, okay, that's what expect what is expected from me. Um, that worked well the last times. That's what I should do. Or even if you already have some experience as a field assistant, just that you can improve your teaching in the field. And this um, is connected to a lot of like the IR vision. And so for once it's a strength in the competence in the field for teachers. Um, so how to teach in the field and that's basically progress domain number three. It also involves students in the co-creating of the learning materials since I'm a student. And then also we will get feedback from the students. So we like really want to hear what the students think about it. And then, so that is progress domain number two. And it also connects mainly for the, to the progress domain number four because we're uh, documenting and developing field learning methods. So like we uh, firstly documenting it, of course, but then also see um, like it is a growing process. It's not like once set in stone. It's now it's done, and we we would like like if there are some more things to um, try out or something, uh, it's nice to develop that a little bit. And the current status at the moment is basically that I did some literature research and gathered input to outline like the original idea of fieldwork because yeah, fieldwork is super great and we have a lot of fun 
that, yeah, why are we actually doing it? Why are we putting the students out there? What is the goal out of it? What should they take out of it? Um, uh, so yeah, to sum that, sum that up a little bit in the um, teaching manual. Then I worked on some feedback forms, which are not sent out yet, but um, hopefully soon. So one of them is for a former field assistant. So we get like the tips and tricks of it, um, what worked well, um, for example, or like there could be tips from bring enough snacks for everyone over to like specific instruments, like press this one button first and then the other, because that's how the instrument works better or something like that. Um, then, as I mentioned before, asking the students for feedback, because um, yeah, the, the students are the ones who experience it. So um, asking what was helpful, what was missing, did they feel prepared? Did they feel um, safe during the field work? What was missing afterwards? Or like a lot of steps in between. And during those, um, feedback forms, I also realized that it would be great to ask the course leaders what they actually expect from the field assistants. So um, there will be another feedback form for the course leaders, um, just to kind of clarify that as well and give the field assistant also an idea what they should actually do in the field. So that is basically at the moment the current status and taken from there, um, I want to implement those feedback loops to have the infrastructure so that after every course, it's just or after every field work, it's just sent out to the field assistants and the students so that this manual can grow. Because as I said, it should not be set in stone. It should not be like, after I finish this project, that's how it should be done. It should be grow over time. And like, uh, like um, all the experience from the future should also like be implemented there. And um, that, yeah, all the future field assistants can, um, yeah, have something to look at and see what could help. Um, and then, of course, also transfer to other universities, because as I said, in yeah, at UNIS, we have a lot of field work already included in the courses, but maybe that can also help for the universities at the mainland, that they have something to, uh, how to implement field work, who to ask to help out for the field work, not just that the teacher has to go out with a class, but like that there may be, um, some other steps in between. And also already as like uh, Daniel's uh, presentation now to uh, connect that to other IF projects because for also for the field assessment, it would be great to have like a virtual field guide before uh, going out in the field because maybe they haven't been there yet. And so like there's also great potential to connect that to other IF projects. Um, but yeah, that's basically my presentation. And if you have further questions, I'm here to answer. Look like there are no questions. Um, very interesting project, uh, Florina. And I think this will trigger someone to maybe get in touch with you. Uh, I'm looking forward to the feedback loops, especially. Um, okay, then I think we're going to the last one. Björn, could you share your screen? Yes, uh, let's see here. Mm. Yep, can everyone see that? Yes. Perfect. Yes, so I will be talking about a um, project um, that I recently got funded called the Seducate. And this work is by um, yeah, myself and as well, uh, Hank uh, Kears and Sigrid uh, Nassheim. So just a, oh, there we go, just a uh, quick overview of the actual objectives of Seducate. So Seducate aims to automatically create sedimentary logs of different uh, depositional environments in an interactive GIS environment or a geographical information system to really engage and provide feedback to students in an interactive active learning method. 
And the reason or the inspiration why we originally uh, searched for these um, or, or this uh, funding was really that there was a lack of existing uh, teaching material to uh, show the vertical and lateral var variability that exists in, um, in uh, sedimentary logs across a sedimentary system. And for students to understand the fundamental concepts of uh, sedimentology, it's really important to understand not only how uh, sedimentary logs change in a vertical profile, but also in a plan, plan view uh, perspective, how it changes uh, laterally, both down dip and um, a long strike, a um, sedimentary system. And finally, an objective here is that all this should be a constructive alignment between the material that is usually being taught in uh, sedimentology courses, uh, how it's being taught, and how it is um, assessed. So the idea here that, that this plugin that we're essentially um, building in this GIS environment should be able to um, uh, complement existing um, sedimentology course curriculums. So the relevance of this for the iEarth um, grant um, uh, scheme of things is mainly in two domains. So domain number two, where it's a student learning environment. And this is, again, that we want to create an interactive method for students to explore different depositional environments and explore how these sedimentary logs can vary within one single um, yeah, depositional environment. And also domain four, where it's about um, field learning. And the idea here then is that by improving a student's theoretical understanding on how sedimentary logs are used and how they're used to interpret different depositional environments, that this will maximize uh, field excursions by really aligning the theoretical concepts with the practical work that's being done in the field. So the status of this project, um, it's quite, um, quite um, new. So we got this funding in this uh, most uh, recent call in the spring of uh, 2021. And we just uh, had a, a startup meeting last uh, month. So we are, uh, first and foremost, very happy to have uh, Sigrid, uh, who will be working on this um, as a uh, research assistant. Um, <clears throat> and then on top of that, we have an initial set of scripts that have already been developed, which show a proof of uh, concept. So down, this, uh, down here in the lower left-hand corner, we see a paleogeographic map which shows a simple map of a floodplain and channel and delta and shallow marine. And what we do essentially is <clears throat> we automatically select different locations that represent locations of um, where a sedimentary log uh, was made. And we automatically create a sedimentary log that corresponds to that location. So what's really nice then is students can um, get these sedimentary logs, interpret the different trends and sedimentary structures that we usually use to identify a depositional environment. And then based on that, students can interpret the type of a paleogeographic map um, that they um, think might fit that model. And the really nice thing is because this is automated, you can add how many sedimentary logs that you will want to really show how extra sedimentary logs uh, can help improve a paleogeographic map interpretation. 
In addition, <clears throat> Henk and I have uh, finished a manuscript on this concept, um, but we'd really like the um, interactive plugin to be uh, finished as well before um, uh, submitting that um, manuscript. So the plan forward then is to improve these existing scripts and integrate them in an open source uh, QGIS plugin. So we have um, QGIS uh, environment here. And really to start adding some realistic examples from a range of different uh, depositional environments. On top of that, uh, we wanna develop uh, student-oriented learning exercises, actual steps for uh, teachers and students to um, uh, follow, to actually use this uh, plugin that we're developing. And in uh, conjunction with that, we want to evaluate this plugin by, um, by applying it in a first year uh, bachelor student um, uh, course uh, practicals and getting feedback from the students uh, themselves on how we can improve this as to uh, maximize the, um, the effectiveness of, of this plugin. And then finally, we planned to present this work at the winter conference. There's a question mark there because that winter conference has now been moved to May, which is not really winter anymore. So we might have to um, think about if there is another uh, suitable uh, conference um, to present um, this work as it moves along a little bit further. So that's all I had. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? So Bjorn, what's the status on this uh, QGIS uh, software in compared to, I mean, for uh, for most universities, they have, they're using ArcGIS, right? Or is that, how is that like on a broader scale in other countries? And I mean, uh, I guess there's a reason for why you're, you're using QGIS. I mean, <clears throat> Q, QGIS and ArcGIS are very similar. Um, QGIS is more popular in mainland uh, Europe, definitely. Yeah. Uh, essentially, they have the same functionality. The only thing is that, yeah, QGIS is open source. So I like that because you can, yeah, freely share it with anyone in the world. Um, so most universities have ArcGIS, but unfortunately, you know, a license, once you start getting out of that, Academia is around, you know, fifty thousand U.S. dollars per year, which can be quite expensive for, um, yeah, some people in some countries and some universities, definitely. Um, so it's just, um, yeah, to have a broader accessibility, essentially. Mm -hmm. 